All right, so in this video, we finish up our discussion on the chi-square goodness of fit test. Again, a goodness of fit test is used when you have one categorical variable with more than two possibilities, and you're trying to see if your variable matches what you think is already true or the established truth in a situation. And there are going to be four steps for these, just like there have been for all the other problems, P and U problems we've taken care of. And you'll check your conditions like we usually do. The random condition and the 10% condition work the same as they always do. You need to have a random sample. Last chapter, we talked about random independent samples because we had multiple groups. Here, we just have one group. So it's just a single random sample that we're looking at. Or I suppose there could probably be random assignments um, if you were looking at people's responses to one thing. So the randomness condition. Your 10% condition works the same as it always does. Your sample is less than 10% of the overall population. So these two are the same as they always are. And then the large counts condition, for P problems, we had that whole N times P greater than or equal to 10 thing. Here, what you're going to do for large counts is say that all of your expected, not observed, but expected counts are greater than or equal to five. And that is basically gonna be how we lead in to a chi-square four-step. So our context for the day is gonna involve car color looking at um, cars in Arizona. So the distribution for car colors across North America is shown in the table or the line right here. This is across North America. And then this student, Cass, is wondering if things are different in Arizona, where the weather's a lot hotter. Maybe people choose their color of their car differently. You don't want like a black car in the heat because it's going to just be dreadful when you walk into it um, super hot everywhere. Maybe people want lighter colored cars. And that's kind of what the student is thinking might happen. So it's four step time. The first thing we would want to do is set up hypotheses on this problem. So our HO and HA, and like we've talked about before, those should be in words when you actually do that. So HO is gonna basically say the distribution of car color in North America is the same as in Phoenix. So there is no difference between Phoenix and the rest of North America, status quo. HA is gonna say there is a difference in the distribution of car color between Phoenix and the rest of North America. So I'm going to pause and get those written up there for you guys. All right, so hypotheses are established. HO, no difference, or you could say if you wanted to say it differently, the distribution of car color is the same in Phoenix and in North America. HA is going to be that there is a difference or that they're not the same. Either way you want to do it. Remember the word distribution, the distribution of car color is a really important word when establishing your hypotheses. Next up, we're going to check our conditions. And when we check our conditions, it's a random sample of 300 cars. So that's easy. 300 is less than 10% of cars. And then ask yourself, would that be cars in Phoenix or cars in North America that we'd be looking at? The answer is in Phoenix, because that is where we pulled our sample from. Um, so we're looking to see that 300 is totally less than 10% of cars in Phoenix. And the last condition is that expected counts. Before we can verify this, we actually need to calculate our expected counts. Now they give us percentages here. We would need to take each of these percentages times 300 to figure out how many we would expect to see in our sample. And I'm gonna write that as like a third column right here. I'm gonna show work on at least one of these so people can see what I'm doing. And I'm just gonna fill out the rest. So I'm gonna pause and come back with those. All right, so there are all of my expected counts. And then I would say for my condition here, all expected counts, which are shown above, are greater than or equal to five. Um, I don't have to rewrite the numbers and say 69 is greater than or equal to 5, 54 is greater than or equal to 5, as long as they're somewhere in the problem. But those expected counts need to be shown. 
had I not written down the green numbers and showed a little work, you'd lose credits. If you, you can't just like say it without having it somewhere. So tell the grader where to look, or um, you can also put them in the condition spot over here if you prefer. Either way is cool there. Comment on this. Green barely passed the count right there, but notice they also have an other category at the end. So things like purple cars, orange cars, like probably don't pass the five condition by themselves. So they got lumped together and they can be a category. If green would have been just a little lower, we could have just thrown green in in the other position and got our five expected counts that way. So the next move is gonna be actually doing our calculations here. That's gonna mean for our do step, we're gonna find our test statistic and we're gonna calculate that guy like we've been doing by doing observed minus expected squared, divide by expected and adding all of those up. Do that for at least the first two colors and I will just tell you the answer overall. But I want you all to have practice actually calculating your test statistic. So do it for white and for black and show your work and then the rest of them, I'll just tell you what you end up getting. So we'll come back with that in a second here. Pause your video. All right, so I'm back with the first two terms right here. You can see my work shown, observed minus expected squared, blah, blah, blah. You get like a 3.26 for your first term and a 4.74 for your second term. And you would just keep on adding those up, all eight of them. I'm gonna be honest, I didn't even feel like doing that myself. I used my calculator for a shortcut, which I will show you momentarily. But if you add all those up and do your work, you will get a chi-square test statistic of 29.92. Also, I mentioned this before, but I'm going to say it again. Taking a square root of this, because it's you see a squared and like you're so tempted to just square root is what we always do in math. Get away from doing that. The chi-square in of itself is what we want. We will never do a square root on that value. What happens now? Well, we could go back to our table and we can get a p-value that way. But our calculator actually does have an option that we can use. That option is going to be in the distribution menu, second vars. It's where we do like our normal CDFs and all that stuff. And actually, it's you can even see right here, it's in the menu. You just probably never looked at it before. We want chi-square CDF for this problem to get an area. So if we click on that option, it's going to give us a lower bound. Remember when we do chi-square problems, those are going to end up being right skewed like this. So our 29.92 is somewhere presumably like here. We want the area to the right from that. So when we actually go about calculating this, I try not to usually show you guys all my crazy tabs here. Sorry. Lost my calculator. Call it back. My lower is 29.92. Uh, my upper is just big number, and I have seven degrees of freedom because there were eight categories in that initial table. If I do that, it will spit out 9.82 times 10 to the negative fifth. That's going to end up being my p-value. So I did a chi-square CDF. Lower was 29.92. Upper was big number and my degrees of freedom were seven. That makes my p-value, it was 0 0.000098. That p-value is gonna allow us to make a conclusion. I forgot to specify my alpha in this problem. That should have gone up here by my hypotheses. I assume they didn't specify, I'm just gonna use 0.05. So since our p-value here, is approximately that, definitely less than alpha, we are gonna end up for this problem rejecting HO. So HO said, hey, Phoenix is the same as North America. There is in this problem convincing evidence of a difference in the distribution of car color between Phoenix and North America. Our chi-square test statistic was large enough where something's actually up here and we can be pretty sure we're not following that original percentage data for North America. Those numbers are too far apart. Now, 
I did promise you guys earlier. Oh, and then for this, we could have made a type one error since we uh, ended up projecting. Not going to talk too much about that right now. That should be kind of easy old review for you. Let me show you the even better way to do it on the calculator. Because I didn't want to get that 29.92 by hand. That was too much. So there's an even easier way to do this problem. What we're going to do is go back to our favorite menu, which is not just the distribution menu, but the stat tests option. Oops. In that stat test option, we're going to look for the chi-square goff or goodness of fit test. Not just chi-square. Chi-square goodness of fits. And when we choose that one, it's going to ask us to have our observed and our expected in the calculator already in L1 and L2. So what I would need to do in order to make this happen is go stat edits, and I would need to type in my data. Observed for my sample would go first. So I got all these numbers right here. I probably could pause myself, but whatever. I'm just going to make you guys watch me type all this in. So I got my observed in L1, and then my expected counts are going to end up going in L2. Again, percents are no good here. You need the actual numbers that you calculated. So when I type all of this in, then I'm going to quit out. And I'm going to go back stats, tests, and I'm going to run a goodness of fit test for this data. Got my observed, got my expected. My degrees of freedom are seven because, again, I have eight categories here. And if I calculate that, you're going to get the test statistic, which I cheated and said earlier. And you're also going to get that exact same p-value here. It does report the degrees of freedom, and you would give those three things. The last thing we need to talk about in this video is that last thing, contributions. So let me kind of scroll through this here. After you run your test, if you use arrow keys, it will allow you to scroll and see these numbers. Once you hit something, actually, if you hit enter or click something, it'll lock it. So you'll have to just do a Goff test again to actually see this. But you can scroll through these guys and see what the biggest ones are. I will come back to this in one minute here. I want to point out this 15 is real big. And there was also a 6, which is pretty large. So the 15 and the 6 are were my two largest numbers there. I'm going to come back for that. But let me tell you what you would want to do. Um, I forget what number on the calculator that was. Let me write that down for you all. Um, The goodness of fit test was choice D on the list. So we would go stats, tests. And we would choose D, which was chi-square goodness of fits test. And then what we would do is we would report the name of the test. So we got chi-squared. That is just all kinds of messy here. Chi-square goodness of fit tests. We would report our test statistic, 29.92. We would report our degrees of freedom, which is 7. And then we would give the p-value which was the 0. 0.00009 number. So instead of doing chi-square CDF and drawing the picture and finding the p-value that way, feel free to just use the calculator. It's honestly easier that way. Last thing in this section, the idea of a follow-up analysis or um, looking at those contributions. So the follow-up analysis or the contributions thing, what that does, each color in my um, sample here, provided different evidence for HA. My first piece was a 3.26, my second piece was 4.74, and then I would go and I would look at all those other options. I forget which ones were the biggest, so I'm gonna pull that back up real fast. <laughs> Rerun my Goff test here, and let's see. So I had a three point something, a four point something. The third one was six, so that was gray. Uh, it was white, black, gray, then I had silver, then I had red, then I had blue, green, and other. So other and uh, shoot, gray, I think, the third one. So the third one and the last one were my biggest ones here. Double check that one more time. It's a little bit awkward on these calculators. Some of the nicer, newer ones make it look better. But the third was 6.02. So 
So that was going to be gray cars. Their contribution was 6.02. And then other was like, oh, shit, I forgot the number. Shoot, 16, 18, 15. It was 15 point something. So I had like three point something, four point something, six point something, 15 point something. A follow-up analysis looks at the individual pieces. That will be this stuff down here in your formula. And what it does is it flags, big numbers flag the things that were the most off. So if you look with grays, we got 31. We thought we'd see 48. So there were a lot less gray cars in Phoenix than we would have expected to see. That was kind of a big deal. The other one is we saw way more other colored cars than we would have expected. There was a difference in black, there was a difference in white, and so on. And you can't necessarily tell just by looking at them what the biggest ones are going to be, because we have to divide and stuff afterwards. Like, who would have thought 39 verse 21 is a bigger deal than 84, a way bigger deal than 84 verse 69 or 38 verse 54? You might not always know. But this flags the things that are the most difference. So if there is a difference in Phoenix versus North America, it's probably due to the colors that are flagged right here. So evidently, gray cars were a lot less popular in Phoenix than we would have expected for them to be, which is kind of interesting. I would have guessed black would be really unpopular because it's such a dark car. Um, other is kind of high compared to the, what we'd be expected. That's kind of interesting. Um, if I was going to like think of a reason for that, like picture like those, like, <laughs> so perhaps a lot of people who are retired and older move to Phoenix. Um, it's a good destination for people after they retire because it's warmer there and nicer there. Those like champagne colored cars that like people not necessarily in my age bracket like to drive, but people who are retired perhaps like those more, maybe those were more popular. I'm just spitballing here, but there was a difference between Phoenix and North America primarily in those other cars that were more popular. Maybe people love orange cars in Phoenix. I don't know. Um, and then there were actually a lot less gray cars than we would expect as well. Other was the most convincing though. So if I was going to do a follow-up analysis, first of all, only do it when asked. So if they said perform a follow-up analysis on your goodness of fit test, that's something that happens occasionally. They'll be like, talk to me about my test statistic. Like what was going on? Why is there a difference? Only do it if they tell you to. And they'll ask you by name for a follow-up analysis. If you do a follow-up analysis, you should talk about one or two, let's say two, um, of the most extreme contributions. And I will put that in words, um, but I'll pause so you don't have to watch me write it. All right, so I have a little follow-up analysis written down there. Again, only do this if you are asked. If you provide extra information trying to go above and beyond, then you're wrong. It'll hurt you on your answer. But sometimes you will see them say on a chi-square problem, perform a follow-up analysis on your data. So you look at those CNTRB contributions on the calculator. Or if you did it by hand, you could look at all your little pieces right here from your formula. Pick the biggest ones. But when you pick the biggest one, they're all going to be positive. You never get a negative contribution because we square everything. So you got to look back at your data and see if they were more popular or less popular. So I saw number three and number eight were the biggest ones. Gray right here, I was under what I expected to see. There were less than I expected. Other, I was way over what I expected. So again, is it those champagne colored cars? Is it like, I don't know, some sort of like super cool sun reflecting, maybe yellow reflects the sun, I don't know. Um, we don't know what it is, but other was way more than expected and then gray was way less. Those two, if we removed gray and other and didn't bother counting those cars, we probably would have not had statistically significant evidence. The two that really drove up that 29 that we saw were the other and the gray colored cars. So that's how you would perform a basic follow-up analysis.